It's 8.30 in the morning, I'm in the middle of Shropshire, and I'm looking for a pub. This is the Kinnersley Arms in Leighton. A couple of miles down the road is Ironbridge, where most people reckon the Industrial Revolution began. And hidden in the bowels of this pub, right underneath me here, is something that might just have helped kickstart that revolution. And this is it. It may not look much now, but 300 years ago, this place would have been full of noise and activity and the most incredible heat, because this was a blast furnace used for making iron. We know the kind of things they would have made, things like these cannonballs, but how exactly did they make them? Because something may have been happening here that changed the course of industrial history forever. Time Team have been called in to unlock the secrets of Leighton's hidden furnace, and we've got just three days to do it. It's the start of day one, and our hunt for the hidden furnace begins in the car park behind the pub. The piece of the furnace that you can see in the pub cellar, behind this wall, is just part of a much bigger structure. The rest of it should be buried somewhere underneath this tarmac. Geofiz have already started to look for it, under the watchful eye of pub landlady Jane Woods. But someone's been impatient to get digging. Mick, two things I thought I'd never ever see on time team. A hole's been dug before we've got the geophys results in, yeah. and it's slap bang up against a wall. Well, now yeah. you've told me never dig trenches That's there, because right. the yeah. wall might come yeah. down. Yeah, but we have a very good reason, Paul, don't we, for doing this? Yes, we're digging these two holes here because we were asked by the structural engineer to ascertain what this wall's actually sat on. Um, and whether it's safe to dig a trench up against the wall here. Why might we need to dig a trench near the wall? To explore the, the rest of the furnace. You've already seen the blowing arch in the, in the cellar there, and that was part of a, a much larger structure, perhaps five metres square, that was here where we're stood now, with associated casting areas and perhaps other buildings as well around in the car park area. Paul seems pretty confident about what's lurking under the car park, so what exactly are we looking for? In most 17th century furnaces, the raw materials were loaded at the top of the furnace in something called the charging area. To heat it to the right temperature, bellows pumped air through the blowing arch. That's what we can see in the cellar. Now it was time to extract the molten iron, which ran out of the furnace into sand moulds in the casting area. That should be somewhere under the car park. Behind this wall is the cellar with the furnace in. But, as you can probably see, the wall is wonky. In fact, it's a hazard and we can't do any work down there at all unless we knock it down. The problem is this pub's a listed building and you can't just go knocking the walls of listed buildings down, not even modern ones like this one. So we had to get permission first and you can't believe the palaver that we went through. First of all, we had to see the county conservation officer, then the county building's archaeologist, then an English heritage archaeological officer came along, followed by an English heritage structural engineer, followed by our own structural engineer, and the upshot of all those meetings was that we are allowed to do this. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> now the hard work's done, I've handed over the wall demolition to Ian. As more daylight floods into the cellar, we should soon get a much clearer look at what's been hiding down here. In the car park, the test pits show it's safe to dig within a metre of the pub without damaging its foundations, so that's where Trench 1's going. Somewhere under here should be the other side of the furnace you can see round the corner in the cellar, where the last bits of clutter are being cleared away. And we thought it was just a furnace hiding down here. Well, now the light's coming through, you can really see that this furnace was just part of a huge industrial environment, can't Well, you? yes, you can see here the, the, the blowing arch, 
uh, where the, the air for the blast for the blast furnace, which would have uh, enabled the fire to be much hotter and create molten iron, went in here. And the, the blast itself was created by two enormous bellows that were powered by this water wheel here. As the water wheel turned, it rotated a huge axle. A series of pegs on the axle pushed the bellows down, forcing a powerful blast of air into the heart of the furnace. Then a counterweight would drop, opening the bellows again, ready for the next blast. It was a non-stop cycle which kept the furnace hot enough to smelt iron. The furnace would have been going continuously when it was in operation, this water wheel going all the time, powering the bellows, and each period of operation, or campaign as it was called, would last perhaps seven, eight, nine months, something like that. Um, and then in the summer they'd take the lining out and rebuild it, because obviously it would be fragmented and made friable by the heat, and then start again the following winter. There's a lot of woodland around Leighton, but there was even more 300 years ago because trees were a vital ingredient for making iron. They were used to provide charcoal, the fuel of choice for all 17th century furnaces. Charcoal was better than wood because it burnt at a higher temperature and it had less impurities than coal. So how high are we actually going to build this thing? We're going to try to make charcoal the 17th century way. We're starting early because the process takes at least three days. The first stage is to build up a stack of wood for burning. It's called a clamp, and it's a bit more complicated than your average garden oh. bonfire. At the heart of the clamp is a triangular tower of wood. Right, so we've got our tower. Yep. Now what do we do then? The next now? stage is we start to stack against it all the way round, and we're going to change our triangle into a circle. It may look simple, but the art which turns wood to charcoal is a difficult vertical. one to master. There are various things that could go wrong, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we could not pay attention, and when a, if a hole appears in the covering, the whole thing turns into a bonfire, too much air gets in, and we just get ashes. Um, if we get high winds, one side will burn faster than the other. But this must be all part of the actual craft of actually making the charcoal. Yes. Geophys have finished their survey of the car park and John's got two new targets for us. I think we've got a nice blob there. If you look at the conductivity, yeah. that could be masses of slag that the currents are just flowing through. But it's not magnetic, all the iron's been taken away. Right. So it could be a big pit. OK. And the second thing is that trend in the radar. Yeah. Now, the crosses are where Stuart and Henry have marked the building. Uh -huh. If you look at Stuart and Henry's oh, plot... Great. Oh, it ties in really that well. That ties in really yeah. well. So, more of the tarmac bites the dust. Our new trenches are targeting a possible dump of slag, the by-product of iron-making, and a building which could be part of the furnace complex. A, a different aspect. But there's more to this story than the archaeology under the car park. I'm hitting the trail with Stuart to investigate how the furnace shaped the landscape around it. First stop, the stream. How could a peddly little amount of water like this actually turn that massive water wheel there? It turns those wheels because you use gravity and you have to manage water in a big way to get water precisely to the point you want it and to give you the force that's needed to turn that wheel. And what we need to do is to see if there's any evidence of that in the landscape behind. This really excites you? Does... I do get kind of blinkered vision when you're looking at a furnace. It's just, it's the end product. It's like trying to look at the oil industry by looking at a petrol pump. We need to look at the landscape around. You need huge volumes of water to turn the wheel regularly, day in, day out. How do they manage it? That's what we've got to find out, and I'm going to have to go upstream to, to do that. We're nearly ready to light the charcoal clamp. The trick isn't to burn the wood inside here, but to cook it by driving out the moisture. So the clamp's sealed with soil to stop air from getting in and fanning the flames. Charcoal making takes strength as well as skill. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm glad we ain't doing a 30-foot. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't the only one. <laughs> so, what are we going to do to light this thing? To get the burn started, red-hot charcoal is loaded into the top of the clamp. Wow, from this... Lovely. Things are hotting up in the car park too, but still no sign of the hidden furnace. 
We've uncovered some brickwork in Trench 1, but it's too close to the surface to be anything exciting. I think Jane the landlady is wondering if we've made all this mess for nothing. We've also found some stonework in Jenny's trench, but it's too early to say what this building was. And in the cellar underneath the pub, Katie's been joined by industrial archaeologist Rob Kinchin-Smith. They're searching for the tweer, the pipe which took air from the bellows into the furnace. But I was told that there was going to be a pipe coming through here, but obviously there's nothing there. Well, that is what we've been hoping for, because that is one of the things that's been repeated about this site, is that the, the pipe which took the blast from the bellows into the hearth yeah. was still there intact and in situ. You had two bellows, but probably only one tweer, the blast pipe. Can I have, just have a look here at the yeah, back? Because this is about same. where I think that the tweer pipe should be. If there is a tweer, it would be slightly further down. Yeah. Or this is the socket from which the tweer has been removed. And here at the back, we've got what appears to be the actual lining of the furnace itself. You right. can see it's very, very, very affected by the heat. You can see that bright red colour yeah. and the way it's fractured and smashed. Yeah. That's looking good for what they're doing outside. So, no, I'm, I'm very pleased with what you're getting. Outside in the car park, everyone's down tools for a cup of tea. But away from the home comforts of the pub, Stuart and I are still investigating the countryside nearby. The furnace at the pub, here, stands at the bottom of this steep wooded valley, which has a stream running through it. The stream was channelled down the valley to drive the water wheel at the furnace. We want to find out how it was done. You know you're all saying that you can't see earthworks, Tony? Yeah. Well, this great hill that you just climbed up to is one huge man-made dam. What, from all from the way that, over there? From that side of the valley right to that side of the valley. All that height you've climbed up is a dam that's been put across here to hold the stream water back up on that side. That's one heck of a construction. It's huge, isn't, isn't it? it? It shows the amount of effort they would go to. You can imagine there's a, that still fairly slow flowing stream is gradually building this huge head of water up behind here, which you can then release carefully in a managed way to go down to the mill. You don't look very happy. Well, it's not really prime survey country. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse. There's a weir marked on the map which we, we ought to go and look for. We're finding evidence of large-scale water management in the valley above our pub. But our iron makers weren't the first people to use the stream as a power supply. Documents expert I Colin Toms discovered water. that there was a corn mill on our site before the furnace was built. We've got a lease from 1630 to Richard Newport which specifically mentions that the, the site has been given to him of Leighton Corn Mill oh. for the purpose of converting this into a furnace to make sound metal. And what date's that? 1630. 1630, good. So we know when it's turned from a corn mill into the industrial establishment exactly. we've got now. But is, that's presumably the end of a long sequence. If it's already a mill, do we know anything about it before that? Well, this raises lots of possibilities because we do know that as early as Doomsday in yeah. the late 11th century, we have a right. reference here that there was a, a mill yielding four shillings yearly. Right. Uh, whether or not the Doomsday one is our one, I think will be down to the, the boys out in the field. So, yeah, so it needs the field work to yeah. go look for the dams and all the rest yeah. of it. So, our furnace stands on the site of an earlier mill, but we can't be sure it was the 11th century one in Colin's document. Stuart's route march through the valley has taken us about a mile upstream from the pub, where we've discovered another mill site which could be medieval. This water was channelled here to turn a wheel just like the one at Leighton. One thing's becoming clear from the field work. Long before the furnace, there were mills managing the water supply up here to power their water wheels. When we arrived at the pub this morning, I thought it was going to be a doddle to find the rest of the furnace in the car park. I was wrong. In Trench 3, we found a building, but we think it was built after the furnace went out of business in the 1760s. We've abandoned Trench 2, where there's no sign of the slag dump we'd hoped to find, which just leaves Trench 1. Ah, oh, now this looks a bit more interesting. Sadly, I'm afraid it isn't. It's just a uh, fairly small, shallow brick wall 
some sort of outhouse to the palm tree. You actually get your hand underneath Exactly. It. Well, so, you've yeah. done great in the car park this <laughs> afternoon, haven't you? What about down your end, Phil? Yeah, there's perfectly good archaeology down here, Tony, once you get down deep enough. You see, we've had to go through all this awful rubble and made-up ground to get down here. But once you do, look, there's this good, stout, uh, hard yard surface. And then in front of it, we see these lines of bricks with that, with that clay beyond it. Now, there's a, just a chance that may be the wall that we're looking for. So tomorrow we must rip out all that extra made ground with that awful late wall on the top of it and see whether we can actually pick up the other side of the wall. And down here, look, I've just found, I don't know what the devil this is, it's just sort of spread of mortar tucked away into the corner. There's masses of archeology span down here once you get down to it. Full marks to fill. What about in the cellar? Well, well look. we're just looking at that. Okay. Rob, you've got on fantastically. I'm oh, getting hugely excited about what we're finding here, Tony. We've done some calculations about exactly how much air was being pumped into this furnace, and it's about 2,000 litres for every puff of the double set of bellows. So what's Which, that? That's the equivalent of 500 people blowing out at once. Once a second. Amazing. <laughs> and over here, providing that power, for those bellows, we've been having a really close look at this wheel pit. And we can see, if you look over here, right on the back wall, you can see the original stonework coming down, which is considerably narrower than the wheel pit that we've got here today. And I think this is going to tell us an awful lot about the motive power that provided the force that worked these bellows and kept this whole process going. It's the end of day one, and I'm really beginning to get a picture of what all the noise and all the activity would have been like in here 300 years ago. You've got the water coming down from the hillside, turning this massive wheel. You've got these enormous bellows pumping into here. Let's hope tomorrow we can get really into the fiery heart of the process and find the furnace itself out in the car park. Beginning of day two, and yesterday in the bowels of this pub, we found the entrance to a blast furnace so old it was built even before the Industrial Revolution. So where's the furnace itself? Well, we think it's somewhere in this car park, and yesterday we dug three different trenches in order to find it. And so far, nothing. Phil, any joy yet? Well, no, not yet, Tony, but the main thing is that, that yesterday we decided we've got to make this trench so much bigger. We got down there, what, a metre of actual build-up below the surface of the car park. That's where the archaeology is. And then I'm, I'm pretty confident we'll get traces of the furnace coming off of this wall into the car park. Better find them, then. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Grant. While we dig deeper in the car park, up in the woods, Mick and Victor are paying a visit to our charcoal burners camp where it's not just the breakfast that's cooking. Well, presumably it'll soon be done, because he's smoking like the clappers now, isn't it? Not really, that's steam. Oh, right. Yeah, what we're doing at the moment is we're still driving the water and all the volatile elements out of the wood to yeah. turn it into the charcoal. So what we're aiming for is for that steam to keep coming out and it gradually to spread down the sides of the kiln yeah. until it reaches the bottom. Then hopefully it will turn to blue smoke and we know it's cooked. To fuel just one furnace with charcoal needed hundreds of acres of woodland. So by the 18th century, ironmakers were crying out for a more efficient alternative. When they found it, their discovery changed the world forever. The breakthrough came here in Ironbridge, a couple of miles from our furnace. In 1709, Abraham Darby devised a way of making iron using coke instead of charcoal. His breakthrough caused the explosion in iron production, which kick-started the Industrial Revolution. So this, is this is the furnace in which Derby made history, and it's strikingly similar to the one we're digging up at Leighton. Yeah, we're standing here in, in the bellows area, which is exactly what we've got underneath the pub at Leighton. This is the blowing arch, and we would have had the water wheel here, the can behind us, and the bellows blowing into the hearth. And then we would go out through here, underneath this big arch, out into the car park. Exactly. And this is what we're looking for now, under the car park of Leighton, the arch where the, the iron was cast. And if we move this away, we can see the original hole where the iron 
molten iron and slag was tapped. So you would have had literally red hot molten iron pouring down this just channel. Absolutely, and then being run off into moles or pig beds as we call them for, for later use in forges. That's what we're looking for in the car park behind the pub, where we're joined by a large new arrival. I wonder what that's all about. But in the meantime, it's all hands to the pump in the search for the furnace. know exactly what they were making in our furnace? Very much so. There are detailed accounts such as these from the 17th century, also from the 18th century, which show the furnace is primarily sending pig iron to local forges for refining. But well, that's what it means, it's just the sale of pigs. It is, yeah. Um, but they're also casting on site um, domestic utensils like cooking kettles, pots. Here we have pots sold wholesale, pots sold retail. What about our cannonballs? Well, they're, they're, they're making cannonballs here, we think, from the 1630s, but they really um, galvanise into action during the Civil War. And we have here a letter that says that at Leighton, there is one tonne of battery shot and a tonne of grenadoes. What are grenadoes? Well, they, these are amazing. These are, are a special form of exploding shell, a sort of terror weapon. And the Royalists had a, a specialist, a man called the Monsieur de la Roche, who was mixing gunpowder with... Uh, linseed oil, beeswax, various things to try and produce these extraordinary exploding weapons. Making cannonballs was a specialist job. At the Bliss Hill Foundry, part of a living museum in nearby Ironbridge, Mick's finding out how it would have been done at Leighton 300 years ago. Well, it's a 24 pound cannonball that I'm uh, going to be making here. Yeah. This was originally done for eight Roger victory. will be casting the cannonball in a sand mould. The mould's made in two parts, one for each half of the cannonball. First, a wooden pattern is placed in the moulding box and dusted with chalk to stop the sand from sticking. Some, uh, facing sand, That's that one, which is, is out of the barrow, yeah. Right. This is very nostalgic, you know, in one way, because my granddad used to do this. All right. To make a good mould, the fine quality sand has to be sieved, then tightly packed around the pattern. I'll just uh, squeeze it over first, just so it's picked the, uh, the detail of what's on the cannonball. Yeah. You've got to make sure it's really tight, tightly compact, otherwise you don't get a very good definition. Once the box is full of sand, the whole thing's compacted once again. Cool, straight. There we go. Oh, crikey. Now that is all Look compressed now, very yeah. tightly. Into the, uh, well, it's into the bottom half of the mould now. So that is With the bottom complete, through, work can start on the top half of the mould. The two halves have to line up exactly to make a perfect sphere, and a channel has to be made to let molten iron into the mould. That's what these patterns on the right are for. Now, we've got to put the other half of the box down. With everything lined up, it's time for more chalk and sand. Just like the first half of the mould, everything has to be sieved and tightly packed. If it's been done properly, the sand holds its shape when the two halves of the mould are separated. And the wooden patterns can be removed easily, leaving the smooth hollows, which will later be filled with molten iron, to make the cannonball. Lift that back up now. It's quite heavy. Finally, the two halves are bolted together to complete the spherical mould ready for casting. Wow. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> what do you mean, all there is to it? That's fantastic. <laughs> This is such typical time, team. You leave a trench for five minutes, and when you come back, it's a massive lorry parked up. You've got this extraordinary orange snaky thing. The smell, I have to tell you, is really rather disgusting. Down here in the front of our basement, you've got high-tech equipment, and you've got this thing, which is like a mid-20th century vacuum cleaner thing. What's going on? We're sucking the water out of the wheel pit back into the, the lorry so we can have a clearer look at the wheel pit structure itself. It does look pretty manky down there, doesn't it? Why are we so interested in the wheel pit? Because the structure of the wheel pit, the width of it, its dimensions and so on, will tell us a great deal about the original water wheel that was here. But we can see the wheel, it's here. Oh, this water wheel is much later. This is a 19th century wheel, which relates to the mill structure on the other side of this wall. What we're looking for, really, is the evidence for the early original wheel that powered the bellows here for the, for the furnace. It's time to get pumping. Somewhere underneath all the sludge in the wheel pit, we hope to dredge up more information about how the machinery which powered the furnace actually worked. 
At Blist's Hill, it's nearly time to cast our cannonball. First, the furnace has to be loaded with the raw ingredients of iron making. They're basically the same as those which went into the furnace we're excavating at Leighton, although here it's coke rather than charcoal that fuels the process. Once everything's heated to the right temperature, it's time to tap off the iron at the bottom of the furnace. The mould needs several hours to cool before we break it open to reveal the cannonball. Frustrations mounting in Phil's trench. We're halfway through day two and there's still no sign of the furnace. It's time for drastic action. This wall was built long after the ironworks went out of business and it's all that stands between Phil and his furnace. It's got to go. Whoa! That looks more like it. Whoa, look at that! It's a massive stone, stone built thing. It looks like it's got bricks on the, it's got bricks in there. What you got? Look, we got this massive stone built structure. Look, look at this, this is stone, this is not brickwork. And it's, it's all mortared in. It goes right the way across there. It's coming back here. This, now, does that look like courtyard to you? No, it don't. No. It's incredibly uh, yeah. humbly and... Look at it, there red. it goes again. What do you reckon? I think it's the furnace. Same material as is inside, basically. There we go, you see? Hey! I told you it would be just down <laughs> did. here, didn't I? And didn't you I? said it would be just here. We've got the furnace! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> well done, Luke. <laughs> In the cellar, Here Rob's goes. going to investigate the pit of the water wheel. It's been pumped out, but it's still pretty gloopy down there, hence the fetching green number. So what's down there then, Rob? Is it just rubble or is there...? It's mostly rubble, but I can... Uh, the, the outlet is very big and very clear. Rob's hoping to locate the tail race. That's the outlet through which water was led away from the wheel and back to the stream. Can you pass me a bucket on a length of rope? Before he can get to it, there's still some clearing work to be done. Don't worry, some lucky person's going to sift through all this to make sure we're not missing any important finds. Up in the woods, our charcoal clamp is steaming away. We'll only find out how much of the wood in here has converted to charcoal after the clamp's been cooled overnight. In the meantime, all our charcoal burners can do is sit, watch and wait just like their predecessors 300 years ago. In the pub car park, the hidden furnace is finally showing its face in trench one, thanks to a nifty bit of maths by Phil. Based on the assumption that the dimensions of the bellows arch, which we see in the cellar in there, and the dimensions of the casting arch, which we thought would be out here, would be uh -huh. the same size, we, we put a slot in here to see whether we could actually pick up the casting arch. More or less in the uh, middle of the uh, side of the wall. More or less in the uh, middle of the wall. And lo and behold, look what we've got. This beautiful, tall stone lintel, uh -huh. and it's actually diving right the way down there. It comes along and then there's brickwork which comes round here, returns, and it's going out to that corner Stop there. Veering off at an angle towards the corner like we saw at the Derby Furnace. It's exactly reminiscent of the, of the Derby Furnace. And this stone is basically the lintel over the opening through which the molten iron would pour. That's exactly it. Absolutely. And it's diving down them. The, the, it must be superbly preserved. Excellent. The best thing we can do is to rip out some more of this brickwork and let's see some more of it. All right, go for it. At the foundry, they're breaking open the moulds. I've hot-footed it from sight to find out if our cannonball casting's worked. Yeah, that's it, roll him over and pull the box off. And now, it's just sand there now and your cannonball's in there somewhere. You can uh, knock all that from around that. It'll, oh, I can hear something it'll, metallic. Yeah, it'll be very, very hot, so uh, we must be careful. Some metal here. 
It's, it's called a git, the, the down git, where the iron flows into the mould. A git? A git. It's like an old slang term for gate. So, uh, got to get rid of the useless git? You've got to get rid of the useless git. There it goes. That's it, yeah. No, it's just left with the cannonball now. It'd probably need to uh, clean it up a bit now. It's best if we uh, give that a bit of a wire brushing. Yeah. So if we give it a good wire brushing, taking the excess sand away, we can see if it's formed uh, the full casting or not. It's not bad, is it? That's excellent, that is. That's £24 a full cannonball there. Give you a headache, wouldn't it? <laughs> In trench three, Jenny's come across a pit of charcoal. Could be a, f a fuel dump, a charcoal dump for firing the furnace, couldn't yeah. it, or something like that? It's possible. I mean, until I dig it out, we won't know what date it is, but I think, you know, Jerry will need to look at it and see if it's pure charcoal or yeah. it's furnace debris yeah. or whatever. So you're going to carry on with this for, uh, for a bit longer, then? Yeah, I think now, it, now we know it's there, we've got to finish it off. Do that tomorrow? Yeah. As we approach the end of day two, it's decision time up in the woods. We've asked our charcoal burners to deliver us a load of charcoal by the end of day three. To meet their deadline, they'll need to put the clamp out soon to allow the charcoal time to cool. But the sooner they put it out, the less charcoal they'll get. <laughs> How's it gone then? Dying to know. Oh, is it like that? Are we going to put it out? Well, we're still discussing or, or arguing about this. So, have we got charcoal in there? Well, I think we have. Well, I think we have two, but uh, I think we've got a lot less than Paul reckons. I reckon there's 80%. Yeah. What do you reckon, John? Up to 50%. What can we do about it? We, we, we want charcoal. I want charcoal. I want a lot of charcoal. Right. And I want it tomorrow. Well, I'll admit that if we open that, shut that kiln down now, and open it tomorrow, we'll get some charcoal out of it. But could be only 50%. There's still quite a lot of charcoal. Not good conversion, but it's a lot of charcoal. So the decision's taken to put the clamp out straight away. It'll then take the best part of 24 hours to cool, yep. so we won't discover how much charcoal we've made until tomorrow. It's the beginning of day three and we're still uncovering the remains of Leighton's hidden furnace in the pub car park. But we also want to know more about the people who worked here, so we're turning our attention to the field next door. Yesterday, some pieces of 17th century pottery turned up here, which could provide a clue. We've surveyed over this sort of platform now and we've actually got quite a nice blip in the magnetometry. There's no real building showing in the resistance but we still think it might be worth It's a good a go. side for one, though, up on this platform, isn't mm. it? Yeah, it's a distinct platform that we're standing on. Um, I've got a slight concern about it possibly being a building, because it looks to me to go much further that way. Maybe it's like an old trackway or something like that. OK, he's saying road, trackway. Do you think mm. that could be a, a house? Uh, well, it might just be a sort of half. The obvious thing is for us to put a trench over that and have a look at it, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and I where mean, is it on the ground? Well, it's just over here, but, I mean, it's exactly where the pottery came from. Well, so, that, it's I mean, it's from these molehills here. Well, why don't we put a 2v1 or a 3v1 or something across it yeah. and have a look at it and see what it is, OK? Yesterday in Trench 1, we found the top of the casting area where molten iron was tapped from the furnace. Today we're looking for the actual archway oh, through which the look. iron flowed. There's a big void underneath here, look. Is it going all the way underneath? Well, look at that. I can, oh, oh, look. I can, look at that. I can get That's my amazing. arm right in underneath. <laughs> ah, look. Ah. Yeah. I think this might be our arch. I get that piece of brick out. Oh, look, it's curving up. Look, there's this oh, yeah. big slab yeah, of stone yeah, there absolutely. with those beautiful tool marks, and it starts from there, and it's rising, rising, rising. It's up there. This brickwork here is actually in the build of it. That is part of the furnace. Right. So this is the edge of the arch coming up there, uh, yeah. and it and corners, the and it springs itself, up there, round there. Yeah. I reckon we've got it. Excellent. You have got to see this. Yeah. Stuart was down here earlier, yeah. fettling around. Yeah. He races back into the field, drags yeah. me over in a high degree of excitement. Yeah. He's showing me this path. Yeah. All I can see is a rather rough old yeah, pathway. Nice, nice cobbles, but, though. Yeah, yeah. But he whisked me down here. He's going, look at this, look at this, look at this. And see? Oh, look at that. That's rather good, isn't it? Isn't that elegant? Yeah. 
What do you reckon? What's the date? 17th, 18th century, something like that. 17th century is what Stuart reckoned. Now, why on earth, in the 17th century, would someone have built a beautiful stone bridge like this stuck in the middle of a little field? It's terrific because we have a specific document that gives the owner of the furnace the right to build a road to take iron from here down to the River Severn. Ah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, what date's that? 1633. Oh. Excellent. Yeah. Where on the Severn would they have been going to? There would have been a wharf at the end of this road. So we now know how finished goods were transported from the furnace, across a specially built bridge and down to this wharf on the River Severn. And even better, remember our cannonballs? Yeah. Well, we've got another reference of the Civil War of them shipping cannonballs in 1644 from Leighton Furnace down to the Severn to ship onto Worcester and onto the Royalist That's forces at Oxford. Them, so the Royalists were using this bridge to transport cannonballs in order to destroy the plucky parliamentarians. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Blow it up! <laughs> Blow it up! <laughs> now, let's go and look on the other side. We can get down there. We can now add the 17th century bridge to the picture we're building up of how the furnace slots into the wider landscape around the pub at Leighton. The key to the landscape story is the steep wooded valley leading down to our furnace, which Henry's now mapped for us. What we have here, Mick, is a three-dimensional model of, of the landscape. So here's the, the River Severn running through here in its floodplain, and you can see our valley system running up through here. But two things this, this model shows is, firstly, the large catchment area uh, that's feeding water into our, into our valley here. Right. And secondly, the, the drop that you're getting in height, which is allowing the water to, to run down, which can then power the mills or anything else which needs water power, such as the yeah. furnace. Right. That they're all, it's effectively the only valley which could be used in this area. Yeah. Now, what they've done, Mick, is in that valley, we've discovered at least three dams before water is actually fed to the, to the water wheel. They're actually managing the water, so by the time it gets down to the furnace site, they've got a constant supply of it. Yeah. So what we've now got is a complex which stretches from the river down here to the top of this valley right up here, and it's like a time capsule of an industrial landscape before the big explosion yeah. occur occurred in Ironbridge. Yeah. In the field next to the pub, work's begun on our new trench. We're hoping to uncover a building here to go with the pieces of pottery that turned up yesterday. Looks like we'll have to dig deeper to find it. Meanwhile, in the incident oh, yeah. room, metals expert Jerry McDonnell has been analysing samples of iron and slag found on site. Can we tell from the work that you've done what kind of quality the iron was that we've got here? The metal that they're making is a thing called cast iron, which is an alloy, a mixture of iron and carbon. And uh, it, there are two types of, of, of cast iron. The first is one we call white cast iron. It's a very easy cast iron to make, uh, but it was very brittle. And it would be very useful for making products like the shot uh, for the cannonballs that, they, that we know that they were selling on. The second type of cast iron is grey cast iron. And this type of cast iron is the best type for producing and converting into wrought iron, which is what we know from Collins' research they were selling the bulk of their products on for. So the evidence says that they're actually making the two best types of cast iron um, very, very effectively. OK, so the million dollar question. We know that they used charcoal here, but were they also experimenting with coke? There's been no evidence in the material that I've looked at for any suggestion of the use of coke. So as far as I could say, it has been charcoal all the way through. So while the pioneers down the road at Ironbridge were forging the future, our furnace was stuck in the past. Phil's digging up a dinosaur. Oh, this has come on well, Phil, since this morning. I know it has, Mick. I mean, we've achieved a hell of a lot yeah. in a relatively short amount of time. The frustrating thing is that we've still not actually cracked it. There are still goals to be achieved. You see what I'm standing on, this, this row of stonework? Yeah. This is one side of the, of the actual casting channel. The edge of it runs along there. So this is actually where the iron was... It was cast. That's right, the casting channel takes the molten iron from the, the heart of the furnace out to moulds or pig beds or whatever further, further mm. away. But the frustrating thing is that the bottom of it, watch this. Oh, crikey. At least down there. Oh, there's half a metre down, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So the real goal is to actually try and get to the bottom of that channel where it, it, it goes out over the over the casting floor. So we can only do that by taking that lot away. Well, we can't because it, it's un unstable. Mm -hmm. So we, we might actually be able to get at it at that end. Right. 
The main thing is that we're going to make this trench bigger by extending the trench just out there. Yeah. And we can do it in the time. Anyway, you clear <laughs> yeah, all that okay. out of it. Yep. <laughs> is this the sum total of all the things we've found over three days? I've got a confession to make. Not all of these have come from our excavation. Half of them, these ones over here, have been brought in by local people that have found them and brought them along. So this is it? That's extraordinary. Why have we come up with so few finds? I think one of the reasons is that it's not an occupation site, so there are less finds to find anyway, but it, it is a very small number of finds. It's certainly less than I'd expect to see. Which of these things can tell us something about the people who lived and worked here? All of them. All of them can. They're all very interesting. These, for instance, these are all 17th century pieces. We've got small cannonball, we've got lead musket balls. They tie in very nicely with documentary evidence that we have about the making munitions here for the Civil War. For instance, none of them have been fired, and this one shows that they were probably making them on the site as well. It's not been finished. Now, what about the things that we actually found ourselves? Is there anything that's particularly exciting about those? Yeah, they're very personal. On the underside of this clay pipe, there's a little stamp, a little heart-shaped stamp with the initials G and H in it. Um, that refers to George Hartshorn, who was actually making these pipes about four miles up the road between 1660 and 1680. So this could actually have been puffed by one of our workers standing around in the foundry? Oh, it's more than likely, yeah. Katie's ground to a halt in Trench oh. 4 and there's no sign of a building. Oh, where's my 17th century house then? I didn't find it. Nice. Did try though. Yeah, was there anything there at all? Well, there was just a very thin lens of slag you just see in the section there that would have caused the disturbance in the jiffies. Right. And that's it. Right. You haven't had a very good day, have you? Really? No, not really. You better come and have a cup of tea. Okay. <laughs> Well, there's a big hole there. <laughs> there's still plenty to do on site, but Phil's not been able to resist another and trip to the woods, where it's the moment of truth for our charcoal burners. Charcoal in there. Yes, look, that's charcoal. The big question is, how much? Yesterday, John reckoned half the yeah, wood would have converted to charcoal. Still... Paul yeah, was more just, optimistic. Yeah, We're about yeah, to find yeah, out who yeah. was right. Not looking good for your 80%, is it? No. No. <laughs> it's not looking good for 50%. Hey? It's not even looking good for 50%. So, you're disappointed? Very. Very. I think I've got egg on my face. <laughs> you're disappointed too, John? Yeah, won't be celebrating my victory over Paul. Um, it's it's uh, not a very good burn at all, really. Just how disappointing becomes clear once the clamps dismantled and the charcoal sorted out from the unconverted timber. This little pile's hardly enough for a barbie, never mind a blast furnace. Rob, we've got the furnace and we've got the wheel. Why are you still fettling away? Well, I've been putting in some last bits of detail and they've really brought the story of this building together. What sort of stuff have you got then? We've discovered that this brickwork appears to be of the same age as this stonework here at the bottom and at the sides and inside the blowing arch here. But it's earlier than the vault over the top. So that means that this was just put in decoratively rather than just using one load of bricks all the way up? We've definitely got an architectural statement here. We get a contrast between the light-coloured stonework and the lovely red-coloured brick. What about where you were beavering away down this hole yesterday evening? Well, I was hoping to find evidence of how the original water wheel would be, but it's been quite substantially rebuilt in here. But what I have found is the original water wheel pit was only two foot wide. This pit here is four foot, three foot at its narrowest. So the, form, the old water wheel was using significantly less water than this one. Very efficient use of a very limited water supply. Night and day, for more than a century and a half, the stream which flows down the Leighton Valley drove the water wheel here. Its power was harnessed to pump air into the furnace until it was hot enough to smelt iron, which flowed out through the casting arch we finally uncovered in the car park. This has changed a bit from that hole that we thought there wasn't anything in. I'll say it has. It's the result of a hell of a lot of work, Tony. So have we cracked the process now? Yeah, I reckon we have, actually. You remember that right up there, in the corner there, we've actually got the bowl of the furnace. And that would have been charged from way up there with the charcoal, the ore and the flux. And the whole furnace would have been powered by the bellows through there. And all that material would have been turned into molten iron. 
which would have poured out through when the furnace was tapped through there right the way down to the channel onto the floor of the casting floor that sand that is the floor of the casting floor where you're standing and if you want to know how deep it is watch this <laughs> look at that yeah cool. cool it's truth so where we're standing is the same floor that the workmen who used the furnace were standing on 250 years ago. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Eerie, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Long before there was a pub in Leighton, the furnace in the car park was the hub around which village life revolved. And the countryside for miles around, the woods and the rivers, was shaped by what was happening here. But the cycle of production, which began way back in the 1630s, couldn't last forever. These unique bits of building, the arches, the channels and the furnace that we found over the past three days, may not look like an industrial powerhouse, but in here are the vital elements that brought the Industrial Revolution to life. Except that 250 years ago, flowing out of this furnace was iron made from charcoal. And just two miles down the road at Ironbridge, a whole new generation of furnaces was being lit, powered by the new wonder fuel, coke. And they created a revolution that's still affecting us to this day. They turned this furnace virtually into just a snapshot of a bygone era. And they made charcoal almost redundant. Except it's still got one or two uses. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> And there's more from the Time Team over on Civilization next. Staying here, though, Mark Williams explores the diesel generation in On the Rails after the break.